Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Traverse Area Historical Society monthly program. Our November program will be the last of 2021, and of course, we're all hoping for a more healthy 2022. Uh, if you haven't yet done so, please uh, sign in if you are a member of the society. Of course, we welcome any of our visitors who would like to become members. It's only $25 for an annual membership. And if you aren't a member, but would just like to sign in to receive our email blast, there are, there are sign up sheets uh, uh, at the table at the entrance. Yeah. So I welcome you to do both those things. Uh, today, uh, I am uh, have the pleasure uh, to announce that Old Town Neighborhood Association President and Historical Society member Marty McLeod will be presenting on the topic of Old Town and Traverse City's Old South Side. The program will be about Old Town, or more correctly, all about the Old South Side. Marty has drawn from the research for her forthcoming book, which I understand is going to uh, be available uh, within just a few weeks. And so uh, there is a sign up if you are interested in acquiring a copy also at the uh, membership desk. The forthcoming book will be a show and tell of the story of this vibrant Traverse City neighborhood. Her accounts and research span from 1865 to 1965, when the area first became known as Old Town. And so, without further ado, please welcome Marty McLeod. Marty. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so this. Uh, a map. I'll tell you just a little bit about it before I go into it. Of course, it's the Old Town area, and it's taken from the 1929 copy of the Sanborn map, which is held uh, by the fire chief on Front Street. As far as I know, it's the only copy in town, but um, it is an incredibly detailed, uh, helpful thing when you're looking up historical records to see you know, what building was where at what time. Um, so the copy is a little bit messed up right in, at Old Town, as you can see up here, but, um, but it's a very cool, very cool document. So had you asked the way to Old Town before 1965, you would have been met with a blank stare. For nearly 100 years, the area was known simply as the South Side, probably more than any other neighborhood in Traverse City what we now call Old Town, from Union Street to Lake Avenue and the Bordwin River south to 14th, was shaped by our local topography and infrastructure, bridges and dams, railroads, highways, and the Bordwin Waterway. As many of you are likely aware, the little village of Traverse City was pretty much confined between West Bay and the crook of the Bordwin River until this happened in 1865. Mm -hmm. There had been a rickety little footbridge built in 1860, but it fell into the river in 1863. And this sturdy new Union Street Bridge gave teams of horses and wagons access to the south side of the river without having to make a long detour. And it was the only access for 25 years. But it took no time at all for that bridge leading nowhere to lead somewhere. Samuel Anderson was the first to establish a business, a wagon works, in 1866, and many others quickly followed. Shopkeepers mostly lived above or behind their stores, uh, which soon stretched three full blocks down Sawdust Pave Union Street from 7th <laughs> to 10th. The Union Street Dam was built in 1867, specifically to power Hannah and Lay's huge grist mill, which followed in 1868. This was the partner's first business venture after their sawmill, and it provided the town with both flour for baking and feed for livestock, which roamed the south side rather freely as it was the, the very outskirts of town. In fact, early entrepreneur Isaac Austin established his livestock dealership at 320 Union Street. Is what dealership? 
his livestock dealership right there, right there just south of the river. The area's Catholics, supported by early missionaries, built a 20 by 30 foot church in the 100 block of East 10th Street, where mass was first celebrated in December 1870. Notice the picket fence, uh, which was installed specifically to rebuff all that wandering. <laughs> <All the things. laughs> uh, St. Francis's first resident pastor arrived in 1877, and his top priority was to build a school. In response to his desperate appeal for teachers, six very young and intrepid Dominican nuns arrived by steamer from New York to brave what was unconsidered a wild and savage Northwest frontier. A two-story building at 515 Union Street served as both their residence and the first Holy Angel School. The beginnings of local heavy industry took root when Southsiders Richard Round and his son Harry opened their iron and brass. Uh oh, I better get rid of that. Um, <laughs> Um, uh, Richard Brown and his son Harry opened their ironworks and brass foundry in 1871. The business actually began at 326 Boardman Avenue, but as the business grew and Brown took on partners, it moved to Cass Street and became the Thoroughly Jackson, Calkins, and Brown foundry, and eventually the Traverse City Ironworks. But it was the real, yes. What is, what is there now? At 326 Boardman, it might it might be the government center. That yeah. 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 Well, yeah. Right, right in that there. area. It was right on the river. Yeah. Um, let's see. Oh, but it was the railroad's arrival that had the most profound influence on Traverse City and the old south side, as there were still no roads into or out of town. Right. You yeah. just hold up. The first rail station was built at the north end of Park Street on West Bay in 1872. And it took until 1880 for the Chicago and West Michigan line to come to the south side, stopping at the spanking new freight depot near the corner of Lake and Cass, which is now right near Redbird, or Rearbird, um, and the passenger depot just a bit farther along east of Union Street. The trains carried the region's burgeoning lumber production, including that from the sawmills that were sprouting up around the north end of Boardman Lake to Chicago and beyond. The trains also brought needed products and supplies from the south, but even more importantly, they brought people, workers, many of them immigrants. Drawn by opportunities primarily in the lumber industry, a kaleidoscope of European immigrants fanned out across northern Michigan in the late 1800s. In addition to the Norwegians and the Poles and the Irish, Bohemians from the western half of what is now the Czech Republic came to the Grand Traverse area in droves, and many of them found yeah. both work and a welcome on the south side. By 1885, the same scene across the, board, uh, across the Union Street Bridge is barely recognizable. As I delved into my research, it was immediately clear what a beehive of commerce the old south side was. Barbers, hose and shoe manufacturers, a druggist and a hardware store were all humming and Union Street bustled with restaurants, a hotel and saloons, as well as a truly astonishing number of butchers, grocers, bakers and confectioners. I was also very surprised to learn that Union Street was home to all but one of the city's early undertakers, and it was all in a single block. Wenzel Bartak, an early Bohemian resident, has established his undertaking business at number 324 in 1873, and he continued as both undertaker and casket maker in 1893 when Homer Carter's funeral supplies moved in. I got a big kick out of... <laughs> This ad for Mr. Curtis and his baby in Palmer at number 312. <laughs> um, even Samuel Anderson, the South Side we have bought there? traded in his wagon. Oh, wheels, we could sit there. Black suit I think so. And took up undertaking. 
the first of at least five more generations of Anderson Company funeral directors. There were others as well, but none strayed beyond the 300 block. At this point, Union Street Commerce was starting to rival Front Street, but there was one serious lack, and it took the South Side's bohemian population to address it. The Wilhelm family already owned a prosperous meat market on the corner of Union and 7th, but in uh -oh. 1885, the Grand Traverse Herald reported that Anthony J. Wilhelm planned to build a large brick store at Union and 8th. Limestone mm -hmm. for the foundation was bought off a lumber schooner where it had been used for ballast, but AJ had to go to south to Zealand um, to buy his bricks and had them brought here by boat because all of the locally made bricks were being commandeered for the Northern Michigan Asylum. AJ had intended to build the building as a millinery shop for his sister, but that fickle girl fell in love on a visit to Wisconsin and neglected to return. <laughs> so with a beautiful but entirely empty building on his hands, his fellow Bohemians urged him to open a clothing store to serve the South Side. So AJ and his brother Emmanuel formed the Wilhelm Brothers Partnership and opened their clothing, rug, and dry goods store for business in 1886, advertising that there were no shoddy or secondhand goods in stock. The brothers both did exceedingly well for themselves, and Wilhelm's remained the place to shop for over a century. Other prominent South Side businessmen included Albert Peter Till, who owned this, <clears throat> one of Union Street's many butcher shops. Be sure to note the toe to snout seating that was kindly provided while your order was being wrapped, cut and wrapped. Uh, Antoine de Botany ran into plenty of fellow lumberjacks on his way to Traverse City, but in his opinion, not nearly enough saloons. Uh. He decided to remedy that, and when he opened the doors at 423 Union in 1886, it was clear he had spared no expense. Novotny Saloon, which was one of four on the south side, quickly became the social center of the neighborhood. Though you'd never guess it by this cheery bunch. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I can't, it's what she says half the time. Not at, when she does it fast. Uh, it is really It was Dills for many, many, many years. Oh, really there. Yes, they have a historical marker on the building. Yeah. Yes. I didn't know you could go there. Uh, uh, Tony, as he became known, preferred not to stay up terrifically late. So he worked out a system to accommodate mm -hmm. his regulars oh, just, who uh, wanted a late night drink. So they, those in the know would walk the two short blocks to his house, pick up the saloon key, pour themselves a drink, leave uh. their money on the counter before toddling back to Tony's house to drop the key back off. <laughs> in 1888, Traverse City's Bohemians joined forces and, in a testament to their prominence in the community, organized the Czech Slovak Protective Society at 320 Union Street. In addition to social and cultural functions, the society offered a kind of insurance program that provided for members when they fell ill and covered funeral expenses as necessary. Following the course of many such immigrant aid societies, the CSPS evolved and eventually became the Western Fraternal Life Association. I actually looked them up and they're still running. They were the Western Fraternal Life Association until last year and then they um, joined with another company. So they no longer have that name, but just until last year, it was still in business. In 1889, the old St. Francis Church building was relegated to classrooms and the second church with its 125 foot belfry, which would not have fallen in Travis City. <laughs> <laughs> was dedicated on the corner of 10th and Cass Street. At the right on this postcard uh, is the Holy Angels Convent and School which was moved from the Union Street building uh, to its similarly impressive new home on 10th. 
The South Side got a big boost when both the 8th Street and Cass Street bridges were constructed in 1890. It rather feels like today, you know, that both of the bridges <laughs> are back in the past. Um, this shot looks south over the 8th Street Bridge uh, and the South Side Mills. There are two or three of them in the photo there. Um, and here's the mighty Calf Street Bridge uh, with Washington Street at the far left and the 8th Street Bridge at the far right on the upper side. Admire how long it used to be before both banks were infilled when the American Legion Bridge replaced it in 1930. George Lardy, the South Side Alderman responsible for that infilling, was a produce broker originally from Ontario via Chicago. He opened a huge potato warehouse at 317 Cass Street one of three that were located conveniently near both his 9th Street home and the rail yard. Potatoes were, in fact, a big part of our local economy, one of the region's first exports beyond timber. In addition to his business acumen, Lardy became president of the Traverse City Canning Company on Brick Street. Uh, he was very civic-minded and was quite influential in shaping Traverse City, even serving one term as mayor in his later years. Jacob Furch, who's behind the counter at the left, uh, is, was a second generation Bohemian transplant, and he opened the doors of Furch's Staple and Fancy Grocery in 1894 in a beautiful brick building at 415 Union that still bears his name. And fancy it must have been, because in one photograph you can make out a sign for bananas a truly Epicurean treat in those days for 25 cents a piece. Jake was justly proud, but his well-stocked grocery was by no means the only one in the neighborhood. This is Edgar Newton's little store. And here are John and Bertha Masters. Um, and in fact, dozens of small groceries persisted sometimes side by side into the late 1940s when the growing availability of modern refrigerators changed grocery shopping forever. Jake, it turns out, was a big fan of the new game of baseball and anyone who was anyone sponsored a team in those days, even the asylum. And Jake's sluggers were a tough team to beat in the early 1900s. The Traverse City Hustlers Headed at Novotny's were their region's first semi-pro team, but they were soon followed by the Invincibles, wow. <laughs> who were sponsored by Harvey Pierce, uh, who was the owner of Pierce's Place, another South Side saloon. And speaking of manly pursuits, another big surprise was learning that cigar making was once one of Traverse City's busiest <laughs> industries. From the late 1880s through the early 1920s, at least 30 cigar companies were in operation and 11 of them were on the South Side. The work was extremely labor intensive and tedi tedious, so much so that an assistant was often assigned to read the day's paper aloud. So it should come as no surprise that most of the cigar rollers were women. Many a South Side girl was thus employed, and because women were banned from joining unions, wages were extremely low, about $5 a week, which was certainly not enough to cover rent and groceries, and profits were sky high. Frank Shooter owned another of the city's larger companies at the corner of Union and Sixth, and John Furch, Jake's father, ran a smallish operation out of the South Side home. So uh, before I dispense with the Furch family, um, I wanted to be sure to put in a plug for this uh, short memoir um, by Ed Furch, Jake's son, who was born over the grocery store in 1906. And it re it's really a wonderful uh, piece, just full of charming details from his childhood. Um, and there is a copy in the local his the library's local History collection, and I also have a uh, uh, soft copy if anyone's interested. 
I'm happy to share. So uh, he wrote that in 1987 when he was well into his 80s, and he had still then vividly recalls his grandfather's bushy white nicotine stained mustache. <laughs> So you really can't talk about the South Side without talking lumber. You've probably heard of Boardman Neighborhood's Oblewood Dish Factory, which is the triple smokestack at Wright, and perhaps the Wells Higman Basket Works, um, which is the dark building in the center with the two smokestacks there. Um, but the South Side Mills were keeping their saws blazing hot too. The Fulgham Manufacturing Company specialized entirely in maple flooring. In addition to lumber, the Southside Lumber Company on Lake at 8th Street specialized in sawing lath and shingles. And here's the M.E. Williams Flooring Company, which you'll hear about again later. To help orient you, this is looking north west and that's the 8th street bridge in the center the traverse city manufacturing company was a general planing mill it's also where um, william brown got his start they they went through about seventy five thousand board feet a day at 10th and lake they also did specialty custom work of doors, window sashes, and uh, store and office fixtures. And finally, the iconic Brown Lumber Company, um, not looking quite like you might remember, uh, which stood at Lake and 10th from just after 1900 to 1994. Carr and Google there um, bought uh bought it in the early 1900s from uh, brown himself and you can't talk lumber without talking transportation there was a major railroad reorganization in 1899 when the chicago and west michigan combined with two others to form the pear marquette railroad and this brought big changes to the south side which was its hub the controls for early steam engines didn't operate efficiently in reverse. So what was there to do when you needed to turn around and go back where you come from? Engineers devised first hand powered and then motor driven turntables, allowing engines to be turned right round for the return journey. They were detached from the rail cars, driven onto the turntable, spun around and reattached to the other end of the train. Roundhouses designed to curve around the turntables were built both to service and store locomotives. The big Pear Marquette roundhouse was built on Lake Avenue near 12th. And all three railroad companies serving Traverse City made full use of it. When local factory production was at its peak, the turntable was kept busy around the clock, routing freight trains full of local potatoes lumber products, and even Boardman Lake ice to downstate markets. There was a serious fire in 1907, but the roundhouse was quickly rebuilt. And here's a pretty gritty northeast view, looking back toward the river and beyond to the courthouse, which you see in the upper left. It's, it's living in the neighborhood, it's really hard for me to picture what it must have been like at the turn of the last century. Inevitably, all of the region's big timber was eventually cut down, and most of the mills ended up in ashes, as the Williams Mill did in 1907. When the Ovalwood Dish Company, the town's largest employer, pulled up stakes in 1916, Traverse City was left in dire straits. Our local recession arrived years before the national recession after World War I. City leaders cast about and decided that an automobile plant would be just the ticket to boost our ailing economy. The Napoleon Motor Car Company in Napoleon, Ohio was in difficulty, not because business was bad, but because it was too good it had neither the space nor the capital to fill its orders, and Traverse City promised both. An agreement came together quickly. 
but the city needed to raise $75,000 in startup capital. The newly formed Traverse City Motor Car Company began selling stock shares and the $10 price allowed nearly everyone to get in on the ground floor of what was sure to become a financial windfall. <sighs> A small orchestra played in 1917 as over 2,000 stockholders, business leaders, and gawkers rubbed shoulders at an open house in the state-of-the-art car plant, a newly remodeled warehouse where the Williams Lumber Mill had stood. Although the company's goal was to build 10 cars a day, dozens of orders for its reliable and affordable vehicles remained unfilled and business was floundering. So more money was raised, the factory was retooled, the supply chain issues were fixed, bookkeeping was modernized, and the company name was changed back to Napoleon. By 1919, the plant was at peak performance. 50 men worked 10 hour days, six days a week, and Napoleon trucks be became so popular and profitable that the car line was dropped in 1920. Five trucks a day was now the standard output, not the exception, and Napoleons were sold as far as England, Belgium, and India. Employees were given raises, $1,000 life insurance policies, and even plots on comfy land for vegetable gardens. Then in February 1921, the post-World War I recession hit, and it hit hard. The company faced dire supply chains, delays, and a rapidly shrinking customer base. By the year's end, a mere 13 men were still employed, and the plant sat idle. After attempting a comeback in 1923, the Napoleon Motor Car Company filed for bankruptcy. Some 3,000 stockholders, mostly local, lost everything, and sportsmen took to papering their fishing and hunting shacks <laughs> with the worthless stock certificates. It was a sad end to an ambitious and exciting venture. Do you have a question, Marty? Yes. Does anyone know of any Napoleons that were built in Traverse City exist someplace in the world mm -hmm. or on display? Or There are apparently two yeah. uh, trucks. Yeah. And Haggerty had one of them on display. I think it's local. It's really bright red these days. <laughs> but yeah, they're really, they're really, really scarce. Yeah. And yet, just a few blocks away on Cass Street, the Traverse City Ironworks carried on in full swing, visibly leaching um, heavy metals and other pollutants into the Bullion River. The foundry produced nozzles, car headlamps, and chassis, steam engines, mantle covers, street grates, and an astonishing variety of fire hydrants. This is on Union Street, by the way. <laughs> Uh, even before 1915, the Ironworks was generating profits of over $40,000 and employing dozens of men. When World War II came along, the South Side was drawn into the thick of the war production effort. Defense officials worried that Detroit was a prime, prime target for Nazi bombs and saboteurs and decided it would be prudent to redistribute production to military safe areas. Traverse City was selected partly because West Bay's docks uh, could accommodate the ships that would transport the local production. John Parsons' pure air kitchen plant on Bay Street was converted in 1943, and this second Parsons factory was moved brick by brick from Detroit mm. to 12th Street. The South Side facility manufactured casings for bombs up to 500 pounds, as well as landmines and bomb fins. The concrete on 12th Street, I'm told, is poured over 12 inches thick to accommodate the loaded trucks. Parsons was doing a whopping $20 million a year by the end of the war. With the reversion to peacetime production, the company soon became Traverse City's largest employer and the world's largest producer of helicopter blades. In 1948, Parsons was awarded a contract to make complex tapered wings for military aircraft because it had developed computer support to accomplish the 800 step production cycle. After inspecting the 12th Street plant, one engineering tycoon stated, 
There aren't 25 people in the United States capable of understanding the magnitude of what Johns Parsons accomplished. What he was referring to was the first numerical control machine or punch card, which Parsons on the right and his chief engineer, Frank Stulen on the left, uh, had conceived and developed. But just as importantly, the two had recognized the potential for connecting their computers, in quotes, <laughs> to machine motors, paving the way for commercial airliner production, automated manufacturing, and robotics. President Reagan honored both men in 1985 for ushering in the world's second industrial revolution. When Parsons moved his operations to California, Cone Drive took over the 12th Street plant in 1950. A young machinist named Samuel Cone had started in Detroit in 1931, making a new kind of gear. His worm gear increased torque, enabled quick starts and stops, and greatly reduced gear size. By the end of World War II, every branch of the armed forces was using cone drive gearing for their submarines, guns, aircraft, and so on. These days, the huge 150,000 square foot facility uh, supplies 30 major markets, including auto, solar, petroleum, food processing, packaging, medical, plastics, robotics, and satellite communications. Their gears drive everything from predator drones to advanced surgical tables, astronomical observatories, and the, and the Seattle Space Needle. Even Disney is a huge cone drive customer. It's an impressive operation for something right in our own backyard. Many of you probably already know, although it was a big surprise to me, even living on Union Street, that Union used to be part of US 31. The highway ran from Munson to Front, Turn south on Union, west on 14th, and then south on um, Rennie Hill Road, which is now Veterans Highway, Veterans Drive, and then south to Shum's Corner. But all of this changed abruptly when the Grandview Parkway was dedicated in 1952. Bypassed, Traverse City's business districts, both Front and Union, became ghost towns. But brothers Barney and Tom Deering took a chance when they left the family business, that's Tom on the left and Barney on the right, and bought Max Bauer's Meat Market in 1957. Being a way to reinvest in the community, they demolished the storefront at 407 Union and built anew, launching a reinvigorated customer and service-centered hub of entrepreneurs. Jenny and Clayton Arnold moved Arnold Books from West Front Street to Union, one of the first new businesses in the revitalized shopping district. But it was Barney Deering and fellow business owner, Tony Wilhelm, who are credited with coining the term Old Town in the early 1960s. So uh, it's important to remember that all that is Old Town now is thanks to the vision of those two South Side entrepreneurs. That's it. Um, do you mind if I talk a little? Oh, yes, question. Uh, two quick questions. Um, on a few of the ads that you saw, uh, that you displayed, mm -hmm. it said uh, in the lower right, both phones. What the heck does that I mean? am so glad you asked me that because I had to research that. I noticed that too. So in the book, I actually did an article on um, the early phone system in town. So uh, in the, by the late 1800s, we, we had pretty decent phone service up here in Northwest Michigan, surprisingly. Um, so it started out Northern Telecommunications Company was the first then Michigan um, Telephone Company, then, um, so they overlapped mm -hmm. and at certain times before Michigan Bell, you know, kind of took over. Uh, so at time for a period there, like from 1900 to 1913, there were uh, two telephone systems within completely different numbering systems, which must have to be, especially business owners, crazy. Oh, okay. So sometimes they were able to sync them up uh, and, and have um, the same number, no matter which phone system the, the uh, patron was using. 
but that's what that's all about. Uh, and I'm sorry to have another one, but did the did the city leadership or the industrial leadership like here not foresee you know, in the first part of the last century the the coming exhaustion of the timber supply? Was that did that up? occur to them sort of as a surprise or did they see it coming? Um, actually, I'm sure you've heard of Harry Hanna. Mm -hmm. um, so he was very uh, forward thinking and he sold off his interests in the 1880s. Uh, so yes, he, he, he sold off the timber and he concentrated on building up commerce and, you know, uh, making Traverse City a good place to live. He really wanted to draw people here. And he he would encourage people, even competitors of his own businesses. So yes, um, that he did at least, and I'm sure others followed his lead, but of course they cut down the trees until they were gone too. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Where did the iron come from? Where did the iron come from? Um, probably from the north. I don't know. I didn't research that. Um, it was brass and iron, um, but certainly there were iron smelting um, places, uh, foundries all along the what the shore of of uh, Lake Michigan. So, um, but I presume it came from farther north. Yeah, it did. Yeah. Because even during the Civil War, iron from the U.S. being used for making things and such. Yeah. 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 Uh, so, uh, yes. Yes, you said that uh, St. Francis was originally a mean and then relocated. Do you know what became of the original location with that very tall steeple at the uh, uh, that down, that is right on the corner of Union and Cass, and it's it's where it's playground <laughs> right now. Um, and then the third building that, that was demolished, as was the big Holy Angels convent. Um, that was demolished once the high school built up where it is currently, and um, the church is now at ten twenty five. I think it was in the 1970s. Anyone know for sure here that they tore down the old or the steeple? Yes, building yes. And yes. then built the new one. And, and it was into the 80s that the, the convent. Yeah. I, I've heard, I didn't live here then, but I've heard from people that did that the inside of that church needed significant. Fixing up by the time it was torn down. Oh, I'm sure. So, not ever having been in it, I thought to myself, oh my gosh, what a beautiful old, you know, uh, you know, early 19 or early late 1800s church. They tore it down, and I envisioned this build, you know, beautiful inside. And then I talked to people who actually went to church there, and they said, well, by the time it went down, there were some issues it to. inside <laughs> of it. So, um, I'm not saying they couldn't have been fixed, yeah. but yeah. I have yes. a question. Um, when you were talking or when you were um, researching the current home drive, mm -hmm. does do most of their, does anyone know, do, do most of the things they make go out by truck or by, I would think so. I don't really remember seeing all that in semi trucks like going down Union. You, you don't see them because they cut off and come to the alley and then okay. to 12. So yeah, so okay. they, they come from 14th, cut in behind in the alley. And, and they, they, they have yeah. tens and tens of trucks every yeah. week that come through. We actually, um, in my function as the association president, I was able to uh, convince, because well, I, well, I buttered them up by showing them they were going to be in front. And then I, <laughs> and then I asked them, um, would they mind, because they don't give tours, or, or if they are, they're very infrequent. Um, so I asked them, just for our neighborhood, if they would give tours, and they gave us two, um, <laughs> two evenings. I, and it was fascinating to go through. I, I know Jeff behind you, he was on the tour. And where was that? And, uh, beyond my comprehension of what went on in that building. Yeah, it was very good. Thank you for doing that. 
Yeah. So um, yeah. So it, they, uh, I asked them what's the smallest size gear they make and what's the biggest, and they so they said the smallest one is about the size of a soup can, and the biggest one probably for like the space needle they didn't specify. Um, the gear that gear the gold part in the the picture that was um, six feet in diameter, oh, wow. and those those shiny um, steel, uh, the other part, the worm part, um, they're like this thick. And they're, these are just massive, massive things. Um, and the, now that they're getting into robotics, um, it's kind of cool. They started putting in clean rooms and they're, they're, the place is not air conditioned except in the clean rooms because the gearing, the tolerance is like 0%. And just um, if you were to go in there and hold a gear for 10 seconds, it would throw the whole thing out of whack. Yeah. The tolerances are that precise. Mm -hmm. It's just a fascinating thing. So, yeah, it's really, it's really an impressive thing. And there were there were some people on the tour that didn't even know that was that was back there on 12. Um, so it was quite an eye opener. But if you ever get the chance to see it, do 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 take it. Take it up. Just one more connection from the Catholic community, the Dominican nuns who were the first ones that came up here to teach. There are now four more Dominican nuns now that the school system has brought up. Yeah, I've and seen them walking in the neighborhood. They are not going in. They are now teachers. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure which schools oh, they're at. Yeah. So there are nuns back. <laughs> I've seen a couple of them in the parking lot and there. The ones I saw were fairly young. Yep, too. there. So, the the um, original six who came from New York, they, none of them was even twenty five. They were all in their early twenties, and it really was a scary thing to come from civilized New York City yeah. <laughs> to Traverse City because we um, the Lutheran church I went to growing up there was a an injured pastor who came from New York City. So this was in the 70s, late 70s, and his mother was petrified that he was going to get helped by the union. <laughs> this was no joke. This was in the 70s. So a hundred years before that, it was a really great thing for those girls to do. I wonder how much choice they had in it, frankly. <laughs> yes. One last question. I think I heard you say, excuse me, that there were no roads out of town until somewhere near the end of the Civil War. Is that correct? Yep. The, the trains were the first in in 1872, and the roads, the first road, well, there might have been local roads before this, but the first, the first real road that went out to Lake Michigan um, was built for the post office delivery. So wow. the early mail, so Early mail came first to the area at Old Mission. That they were much more civilized or established than Traverse City was at first. So the the early mail, when they decided in the 1852 that it was time to to get mail instead of hoofing it 18 miles out to Old Mission, um, they uh, Tracy Lay, um, Carrie Hannah's partner, uh, went to Washington with his proposal that we get a post office. And they said, okay. Um, they, he had proposed it being called Grand Traverse City because the old vision was, was Grand Traverse. And the Washington DC postmaster said, no, that's too confusing. You're gonna be Traverse City. So he essentially named the town. <laughs> and- um, do, do you happen to know where the the, the name Supply Road came mm -hmm. from. Do you I everybody don't. know where that is? Is that even on now? It goes to Pipe Lake. No. no. I drive that all the time and I'm in a perpetual state of curiosity. <laughs> through the woods. <laughs> and I, I've been Why? haunting the answer to that. Nobody knows. <laughs> I do not know. So the mail was first brought from down by Muskegon on, on foot by a local native guy named Jake. And Mm -hmm. uh, when the mail got too much for him to carry on his back every week, um, they hired a, a guy and he took his, he cut a road out to Frankfurt, 
And that was our first real road um, that went anywhere uh, other than just locally. So it was because of the mail system. Wow. Talk a little bit about Perry Hanna. I don't know very much about them, and I know they're so critical to the city. Yes. So uh, Hanna and Lay met in Chicago, as, both as young men, and they wanted to get in on the lumber business. And so they set up a partnership. And they were, I think they were both in their early or late 20s. And um, they bought a sawmill, which was basically almost where by the, well, what was the holiday and what's it called now? Uh, Delmar. 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 Yes. So it was right where the Boardman River comes right. out, and they um, bought the sawmill. It was a failed sawmill. Someone, Mr. Boardman, had tried to have to, tried making it go a bit and failed. So Hannah and Lay bought that sawmill because they wanted to cut out the middleman profits. And they decided that early on that every five years, every year or every five years. Someone could maybe help me. One of them would be in Chicago and then they take place six months. and come to Traverse City. What? Six months. No, it's either a year or five years. And that worked, <laughs> that you worked for a while and then it got old. So it ended up Lay went and stayed in Chicago. He was the better educated of the two. And so that was this, they're still their center of business operations of their partnership. And Perry Hanna stayed here, and he, I'm sure you know about his house. Um, on 6th Street, the Junkoff Bureau, that's where he lived. And as I said, he was a very, very forward um, thinking person. So they established the Mercantile, which is the, um, was the Boyne County Sports. That was their big Mercantile on front and Union. Uh, the tra they built the Traverse City State Bank. That was their, um, so Perry Hanna was president and Lay was vice president. And, um, he really was quite a benefactor. He gave land to churches and civic organizations, and he really was a very, very forward thinking man. How come we don't have a street, a large street named after? <laughs> I know, yeah, that's this stinky, skinny little street right here. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. At least we have Lane Park now. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Perry Hannon and the statue. Oh, we got a statue that we put the mask on every now and then. I know. <laughs> and a Frankenstein mask. <laughs> oh, it's fun. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, we have deeds to some houses in Old Town, and they are signed by Tracy Lay of the Lumber Company. Yeah. Oh. Um, so, so, I mean, they were they were doing the subdivision. They were, they were developing the land. So. Well, she she has uh, some deeds um, on the west side side signed by the way, and they were doing subdividing of the land. Yeah. Yeah. So can I tell you a little bit about my book? I'm so excited. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it was a it was an accidental book. Um, we it was it was last. January and February, and we we wanted to jazz up our newsletter for the neighborhood, so we, we started including something called What You Might Not Know About Old Town, and it was just little things, little stories, little, you know, interesting things, and um, so it was during the shutdown in winter, and I, I, so I thought, well, I'll get a couple of heads, so I can just pop them into the newsletters, and it was so much fun writing it. <laughs> but I ended up with 160 pages. <laughs> and I said, so I took it to uh, Jerry Jenkins on Woodmere here, uh, who facilitates book publishing. And I said, what do you think? Could this be a book? And he said, absolutely. And I want the first 10 copies off the press. <laughs> um, anyway, so I published it up and took it kind of out of newsletter format, to a book format. And so that took Wow. So it, it, I didn't know I had a book in me, but um, it, so they're just one and two page, mostly vignettes, just little stories, um, like about Wilhelm's and about Home Drive, some of the things I've talked about. Here. So um, uh, lots of great pictures, thanks to the library. Um, it, it would not be a good book 
without their fabulous pictures. So um, if there's any profit, <laughs> uh, I had no idea how expensive <laughs> it was. Uh, if there's any profit, um, I decided that it will go to the library here um, to help with the local history collection. Maybe get their photos in. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, so, it, so it's up to you guys to make that happen. Christmas gifts. Exactly. One for everyone on your list. So it's supposed to come December 12th. Uh, I just heard this past week. And I do have I have the cover uh, photo proof and a few pages from the book, and then two early kind of working copies. But if you want to look through those, it will give you an idea of. Of what the book looks like. Where can we buy it? Where will it be available or for sale? Or um, it? Get it out of my house. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you buy it, he said, get it out of my house. <laughs> if, if you, I have, I brought a sign up sheet if you want to put some contact information and then I'll get in touch with you. Uh, if you buy it from me, I can sell it to you for $19.95 plus tax. Otherwise, I'll be talking to. Once I have something to show them, I'll um, show Horizon and Brilliant Books and maybe Landmark Books and Thompson Pharmacy. I wrote a piece about Thompson Pharmacy and they said, oh, they said, bring it here. We'll, we'll sell it in the pharmacies. Mm. So it'll be around. Um, hopefully you'll see it. Uh, but you're more than welcome to um, sign up on the sheet and back. What's your next project? Oh, uh, <laughs> someone said, are you going to do central or blend in there? Yeah. Yeah. Said, oh, God. <laughs> this was all totally accidental. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank, you. Uh, Thank you. Yes, sir. When are you going to do a book on <laughs> On what? On 6th Street? Street? Yeah, all oh. the recordings or something else. Yeah. Well, what do you think, Stuart? You ready to live through me writing a <laughs> <laughs> it, it was, it was, it was really, really fun to write this. I, I learned so much, and uh, I met a lot of interesting people because I, um, for instance, uh, if you know the Bramer brothers, uh, Tim and uh, John Bramer, they had Bramer Auto Supply and. Uh, and they both live, they've lived their entire lives uh, in Old Town. Uh, one of them is 83 and a half, he tells me, and <laughs> John is 79. And so I thought I'd do a piece on the Bramer family. So I tried to get them together because I wanted them to kind of play off each other, but uh, couldn't do that. So I talked to, talked to Tim um, and I thought I'd be writing... <sighs> about Bramer on the supply. I really don't like cars. So it was not it was not going to be a fun piece. But what came out of it was a story of growing up in Old Town during World War II. And it ended up being my favorite piece in the book. It, it's just they, they used to so there were three brothers and they used to hop on their bikes. They they owned this town. I mean they were allowed to go all over on a Saturday when it wasn't, you know, or in the summer, they take their bikes over to the commons and they dig worms there because that was the best place in town to get them. And then they'd ride back and they'd cross the, you remember the, the railroad, that gritty picture I showed you? They'd cross all those lines of rails and the hobo camp was right there. And they could rent a little boat for 50 cents a day and they'd get in the boat and they'd fish and they'd, they bring their catch to the hobo camp, and the hobos would let them eat beans out of tin cans. And I mean, John wanted to be a hobo for it. Uh -huh. <laughs> like he was a teenager, and then he decided that wouldn't work out. But so it was just, it was fascinating, fascinating um, to do the research for this. Marty, we have a couple of comments from oh. folks oh. at home. First off, from Amy, she says, Please tell Marty her three sisters are watching when we say good job. Oh, thank you. Uh, and then Helen would like to just know uh, what is the title of the book? It's called All About Old Town Telling Tales of Traverse City's Old South Side. And the last one from Susan is What did Hannah do to start the asylum? Um, well, he, 
uh, really wanted to bring it to Traverse City. And he uh, realized several other cities in the state were vying for the same opportunity. It was going to be a big economic boom. So when it was going to be discussed, it was in the winter. So he found a guide and he put on his snowshoes and he snowshoed to Lansing. Mm. And um, how did, why Traverse City was, would be a great spot. And frankly, one of the, the strongest reasons that we got the asylum here was because of the, the water supply. We have a huge um, water system between 250 and 400 feet down under Traverse City. And so this, this was going to be a wonderful water source uh, for the, uh, so I think that really had, and probably the, the legislators were pretty darn impressed that <laughs> he had snowshoed all the way down. So yeah, he lobbied hard to bring it up here. So. What's our water system from? Uh, we draw it from West Bay now. We do. Yeah. We don't come out of the ground. Not anymore. Most of the most of the artesian wells uh, were capped by. There were a few around. I remember uh, in the seventies um, when we moved here um, from Ann Arbor, there were still a few around. Um, but most of them were capped in the fifties when they started drawing water from West Bay. One of the things they had to do was stop putting all the sewage into West Bay. Uh, they had to do that before they could make it the water source. But well, so it was 1931 when the uh, water treatment plant went in at the north end of Oregon Lake, and that's what made West Bay. So you're taking me out of old town here. <laughs> Anything else? Thank you. This uh, concludes our program for today. We do have refreshments on the side there. If you would like to have some refreshments and talk more with the, this distinguished author. Oh, wow. Uh, and the Senate <laughs> Chief for, uh, for Marty's book is in the rear there. I want to, on behalf of the Traverse Area Historical Society, make a special thanks to the Traverse Area District Library. As you can see here, and not only do we have uh, attendees via Zoom, we have them here, and that would not be possible without the staff here at the Traverse Area District Library. So can you join me? In the Thank you all very much. And uh, uh, we will be sending out our email blast to anyone who signs up to let you know for our next uh, monthly program that will be in January. So please, all of you have a wonderful Thanksgiving and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.